Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, this brother. Right God bless you. bless you. This is the right mic, yeah? Yeah, you can. Okay. okay. Good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. Everybody looks so beautiful out there. And this is a beautiful church. It smells new. <laughs> My wife's over here, Lori, and my two beautiful children, and we are coming from, it's actually Harlingen, Texas. Everybody gets it mixed up with Arlington, but it's as far south as you can go before you get to the border of Mexico, so it's about a 12-hour drive south from here, and we are, we are so happy to be here with you on this resurrection weekend, amen, because this is the resurrection weekend, amen, where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ because the tomb is empty amen and he sat down at the right hand of God amen and when he sat down he gave the church something that was beautiful it was the price that he paid for with his blood and that was to become the sons and daughters through faith saved by faith through grace amen and we're here to just uh, celebrate Jesus and I'm excited for what he wants to do I'm, I'm a little bit, I, I want to look at this guitar back here because I'm a guitar player and that's a really nice guitar. Where'd the worship leaders go? Like this guitar I've wanted for a while. It's got that little symbol on it. And I'm like, man, I want to play it. Is it okay if I, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Me and my wife lead worship too. So I, I, the worship team was awesome this evening. Thank you guys for that, leading us in worship. And I, I feel the Holy Ghost in the building. Amen. And I just want to thank Pastor and his beautiful family for having us. And I just bless this place, this church, and what Jesus is doing. Because I feel the Holy Ghost in this room. Amen. Amen. How, many of you, how many of you attend here locally? Raise your hand if you like attend here locally. Okay. That's cool. You know, the Lord's going to move tonight. Um, I might share a little bit about myself, I might not, we might just follow the Holy Spirit. <laughs> sometimes I'll do that, sometimes I won't. But I just want to say this, that the Lord is going to move tonight. Some of you in here have been crying out for an encounter with the Lord. And I want you to know that tonight is your night. And I also want you to know that it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with the Holy Spirit. Because he's already here and he's moving, I feel it. And some of you in here, listen, there's sickness in your body. I can hear the Lord. Some of you have some uh, gut issues, inflammation. I don't know exactly what the diseases are called, but your gut is all messed up. Ulcers in your, your, your esophagus are right here. That's what I'm hearing the Lord saying. And listen, if that's you, I want you to just start believing the Lord's touching you because you're going to get healed tonight. Amen. We have the saying in, in preacher world that if the, Lord, if the Lord says it, he's going to heal it. Amen. Tumors, growths, any type of growth in your body, cysts on the ovaries, pins in your, your shoulders, I don't know, surgery, something that happened there. We prayed for a lady about a month ago and she had pins and needles in this shoulder and I laid hands on her and she said she literally felt someone come up from behind her and go whoosh, and she felt it go click and she got healed and was able to move it and, and she hadn't been able to do that in years, amen? God can create new bones, amen? amen. <laughs> Cancer, I can hear that. Oh, I don't like that name. That's a demon and it has to bow to the name of Jesus. Amen. Do you hear me? Amen. If you have cancer in here, Jesus wants you to be healed tonight. Amen? Amen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Diabetes. High blood pressure. I'm not just throwing out names here. I'm hearing this. This is what the Lord wants to heal tonight. Diabetes. High blood pressure. There's somebody here that has a, a cyst on their ovaries. Jesus wants to, to heal that. You've been having problems. You know it. Reach out and begin to receive from the Lord. He's going to heal you tonight. He's not even waiting for me. He's already starting to do it, okay? <laughs> Back pain, any type of sciatic nerve goes down into your leg. Oh, let's get that out of here tonight. Amen? <laughs> Anything I just called out, just begin to believe the Lord's already healing you. We're going to lay hands on everybody that wants to be prayed for. 
People that are not filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit, listen to me. Jesus wants you to have that tonight. The free gift to all believers to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and speaking of other tongues. He wants you to have that. If you are not filled with the Holy Spirit and you want to be filled tonight, we will pray with you and you will leave here knowing. Everybody say knowing. You will leave here knowing that you are not only filled with the Holy Spirit, but and with fire. Amen? Because when, when he said that there's one coming after me, he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. We know about that very well in the church, but he didn't just stop there. He said he's going to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Everybody say and with fire. And there's a fire that exists that the Lord wants to baptize us with. And I believe that we're going to get some of that tonight. Amen? <laughs> amen that excites me amen i'm gonna start running up here amen <laughs> let's turn to first john i see a, a, i just want to acknowledge pastor richards in the house over here he <laughs> he didn't he doesn't like that but he pastored a church out in iowa for 10 years and he's out here in tulsa a dear friend of mine and it's just good to see his face yeah give him a hand clap he's <laughs> He's like, yeah, why did you do that? First John, you know, the day that I got saved, I was doing cocaine. <laughs> it's a really unreligious uh, setting. I, I was a crackhead. I was addicted to dope. Anybody, you know what that is? Cocaine? Don't raise your hand. It's so, you know, I know what that is, you know. <laughs> and I had, I had started smoking weed when I was about 13 years old. I had been addicted to porn since I was six years old. My life was spiraling out of control. It was just on a downward spiral heading for destruction. But I'll never forget the day that I was in my room. I was alone. I was about 16 years old, about to turn 17. And I had a little bag of cocaine. <laughs> and there was nobody in that room but me and my thoughts and the Holy Spirit. And I wasn't saved yet, but he was present there. And he was wooing me because he loved me. And I have news for you. You didn't love him first. He first loved you. And salvation is a response to the love that he gave that when you were yet in sin, Christ died for you. And it's important for us to remember that. Because when I was at my worst, everybody say worst. When I was like really rebellious and I was just anti-God with my lifestyle and I was running as far away from him as I could get, I didn't fit in church culture anymore because I didn't look like I was saved and a lot of people were writing me off that there was no hope and we should never do that because there's always hope for people to receive salvation and be born again and be transformed, amen? Amen. And I just want you to get this picture. I was alone. I was in my room and I was doing cocaine. There's not a preacher. I wasn't at church. There was no uh, a setting where the presence of the Lord was like, you know, and we're singing songs. It was just me, my bag of cocaine, my thoughts, and the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, I'll never forget it. I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm snorting bumps. And I all of a sudden just begin to think about God. And I literally get hit with the presence of Jesus, and it just destroys me. Like, I start bawling, and I'm holding a bag of cocaine, and I just, I start weeping. And that is the moment where the resurrection power and life of God came into Nathan Varble's life, and it went, Whoa! and I was born again. And listen to me, I became a new creation. I was saved by faith through grace, but in that moment when I cried out to God while I was doing cocaine, the Spirit of God came in, and according to Titus, the washing, renewing, and regeneration by the Holy Spirit happened. And Nathan Varble died, and I was resurrected to newness of life because I had put my faith in his death, burial, and resurrection, and I was forever transformed and changed because Jesus came alive in my heart. Amen? 
And I'll never forget it. I was looking at that cocaine bag and I'm bawling. I feel the presence of the Lord and he is just doing a inward work of transformation. And I'll never forget it. I looked up, I looked at that cocaine bag and I went into the bathroom and flushed it down the toilet and I became a saved, sanctified, sober child of God. Amen. (laughs) But it was when I was yet in sin that Christ loved me. And that is a revelation that I feel like we never need to forget. Because when you have people in your life that are not saved, that are acting like the devil, can I get a hallelujah? (laughs) And you know, we write them off and we're like, but do you know what they did? And we start talking to everybody about it, you know, like don't raise your hand there, don't sell yourself out, you know. That when people do not deserve mercy, that is when the children of God are supposed to learn to extend it. And show them the love of God that first loved them when they were yet in sin. There's no such thing as salvation unless it finds you in sin because we were all unrighteous. There was none righteous. No, not one. But never forget the mercy because the mercy that saved you is the same mercy that Jesus wants you to extend to help get other people saved. So when they don't deserve it, when they are doing everything wrong, when they don't look like they're supposed to look, when they're making all the wrong decisions, when it looks hopeless, like some of you in here might have kids that are rebellious, and you're like, there's no hope. Like, I'm here to tell you, there's hope through the power of the gospel. And to never, ever, ever, ever lose focus of mercy because the mercy that saved you is the same mercy that'll save other people around you. No one deserves it. Saved by faith through grace. Thank God for his mercy. Amen. Amen. And he could transform the hardest of hearts in a moment. Don't ever stop believing and praying for people that you know that need salvation. No matter how bad or dark it looks. Amen. Because he's wonderful and he wants to save us. Oh, I could preach so much there, but I'm not going to. Let's go. First John. That was an introduction. First John. We're going to go somewhere tonight. This is verse 1. It says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Everybody say heard. We heard it. Which we have seen. Everybody say seen. They saw it. We've seen it with our eyes. We looked upon. And our hands have handled. Everybody say handled. (laughs) Our hands have handled concerning the word of life the life was manifested and we have seen it and we bear witness and declared to you that eternal life which was with the father and was manifested to us and that which we have seen and heard we declare it to you that you also everybody say this talking to me you may have fellowship with us And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. And I just want to go back real quick to the very beginning of this. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which our hands have tangibly handled concerning the word of life, that, that John is painting a picture here of what it meant to have communion with Jesus. I just want you to know that he's not talking about this Bible in this passage here. Even though you could say that we can handle the word, amen, we can. The word is wonderful and it, it, it should be handled and we should give our attention to it. But when it says that which was from the beginning, which we heard, saw, and held, he was talking about the word that became flesh. And he's painting this picture here of of how he got to walk with Jesus, that he said that we heard him. Well, faith never comes unless you hear first, because faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. So he's establishing this trail that they they heard him, they they heard what he was preaching, but then they, they took it a step further, and he says that we saw him, that they went from hearing to seeing, yeah? A lot of us have done that. You know, we've heard the gospel and now we see it, you know. But then he takes it a step further and it said, in our hands, everybody hold out your hand towards me. Just keep your attention. You're his, they said, my hands, they handled the word of life. 
Well, if, if I handle my Bible, that means I could tangibly touch it. That I'm literally holding this right now. I'm handling this word. That means there's contact physically. It's tangible. It's real. And there's a progression here of him testifying about the life of Jesus that I believe we're supposed to have the same progression in our lives to be effective witnesses everywhere that we go. But it's not just hearing. You know, what does it say in James that there's hearers of the word and then there's doers? And if you're a hearer only, like you deceive your own self. You don't even need the devil to deceive you. If you just hear the word and you never act on the word, you leave deceived according to the Bible. That's a hard word, preacher, I know. I didn't write it though, Jesus did. <laughs> amen? Let's get that big old smile. Everybody say amen. But see, he's saying we heard him, but then we saw him, but then he says that we held him, we, our hands handled him. And, and then he goes on to say that eternal life. And I want you to, to parallel that with John that, that eternal life in John 17 it says this is eternal life this is eternal life what is eternal life is it going to spend eternity with Jesus or is it Jesus coming and indwelling man and you starting to know eternal life right now because it says in John this is eternal life that we may know you everybody say no that we may know you God and your only son whom you sent, Jesus Christ. You get a second witness of that in 1 John 5, I think 20. It says the son of God has come and he's given us this understanding. If you're born again, he brought an understanding with him. And that was a very clear cut understanding that you may know him and that you're in him. And this is eternal life, it says. And so we have two witnesses of what is eternal life. John 17, this is eternal life. That we may know you, Father, and your only Son whom you sent. In 1 John 5, that the Son of God came and gave us an understanding that we may know him and we're in him. And this is eternal life. And then he's testifying, I believe, of what that looked like tangibly in an intimate relationship. That you have to hear him. Then you got to go, you know, you got to go beyond hearing and you got to see him. You got to give your, your affection, your attention, your energy, your mind. You know, it's real easy for us to do that with our Netflix series. Can I get a shakalaka in here? <laughs> Man, all the unreligious people laughed and all the other ones like, wait a minute, that flew over my head. <laughs> all of us give our attention and our time and our affection to something. And John's painting a picture here that it was not just hearing, but they saw it. And then it went beyond seeing that they held it. And I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit wants to become tangibly real to you. That he wants to, the same way, you know, Jesus said that it's better that I go away. Because if I don't go away, then I cannot send the comforter to you. And as Christians, I think we read that so quickly because we think, you know, oh, it's better, Holy Spirit, yeah. And, and I don't think we understand that Jesus is saying that it is, it's, it's better than when I was here. That it's going to be better than when, like, it's better that I go away. Because if I don't go away, I can't send the comforter to you. But if I go away, I can send the Holy Spirit to you. And I think we miss that there's a revelation there that him sending the Holy Spirit in his, his stance or his stead or in his position, that he was trying to get us to see that we could know Jesus the same way the apostles did when they walked with him, when they saw him, when they held him, when they, they were able to hug him. Whenever they were going through things, they had face-to-face -face conversations about it, and Jesus was able to talk to them and console them and teach them and correct them and lead them and have intimate conversations, and there was a relationship that was real. Everybody say real. real. And I don't know if we make that connection when it says that it's better that I go away. Because if it's true that it's better that he goes away, that means what John had, I could have too, through the person of the Holy Spirit. 
because his whole mission is to take of Christ and show it unto you. That he was sent to represent Jesus. He was sent really to be our comforter, our comfort. Like, I don't know about you, um, it's different cultures have different comfort food, you know? Like, in, 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 uh, I grew up thinking that a good comfort food to me is a chicken pot pie, you know? Anybody had a ch- chicken pot pie in here? I'll say that just because me and, me and Rohan have had a lot of uh, friendship and connection through the years, but another good comfort food of mine is chicken tiki masala. Somebody say glory. Like, I, I'm serious. I love it. I learned how to make it, like, <laughs> grinding up those spices, pureeing those tomatoes and those onions. Y'all know what I'm saying? It takes some time. But, I, you know, I throw down in the kitchen, me and my wife, and we try to make butter chicken. We, I mean, like, we love it. You know that, to me, that's comforting when I eat it. So, like, if I'm, like, ever having, like, a down day, like, we so identify with food. Like, I'm, I'm just, I feel a little low. Man, you bring me a big old bowl of chicken tiki masala, I'm going to smile. <laughs> like, you're going to light my day up. And, like, if you throw some samosas with that, oh, buddy, it's on. Like, it's... <laughs> But I get comfort from that. There's, there's, and, and when we think of comfort, you know, like a lot of us have not come to the place where the Holy Spirit has become tangibly real. Where you've gone beyond hearing and then you've gone beyond seeing to where you're starting to, to, to handle the same way as if Jesus was here. To where it becomes real. Everybody say real. Real. And he becomes your comforter to comfort you in uncomfortable situations, whether they're good or bad. And he wants to be so real to us in this tangible relationship. And and a lot of us, we know how to attend church so well where we're always hearing. We hear. We hear about the gospel. We know the good news. We could sing the songs. We rejoice. We praise. We worship. But in the Lord's Prayer, our Father, oh, He's our Father. If you're born again, He's your Father. We should all just rejoice right there, amen? My Father, because according to John chapter 1, to those that believe on His name, to them, He gave the right to become the children of God. So if you're born again, He became your Father. My Father, which is in heaven. Oh, like, teach us to pray, Lord. It's so intimate. My father, how, how more intimate can you get? Like I have two little girls, they call me daddy. They don't know me by Nathan, they know me by daddy. <laughs> and if they ever wanna talk to me, it's a conversation where they're like, daddy, daddy, and it's intimate and there's communion and there's, there's love, there's interaction. Well, think about your father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. Oh, and listen to this. Give us this day our daily bread. That's not talking about your food. Because Jesus said, I have meat that you know not of. And there's a bread that you can eat of that you are fed from. And there's a water that you could drink of. According to John 4, with the woman at the well, he said, if you drink of this water, you're never going to thirst again. But give me this day, my daily bread, to commune to, to the Lord's table, the Lord's sup- supper, you know? Like, I behold, I prepare a place for you in the presence of your enemies. We all know it, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. <laughs> He's prepared a table for all of us to commune with him. And communion is not just the, sac- the, the, the sacraments that we do at church. Because Jesus said in John 6 and 7, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And many of his disciples left and they're like, oh, that's too much for me. <laughs> that's weird. He was painting a picture. Give me this day my daily bread. Teach me to commune with you. But do you know what you eat and what you drink becomes a part of you? Like you digest it and it, they say you are what you eat. <laughs> and he wants us to commune with him on this level on a daily bread. 
every day to where you're sustained by him and that there's an intimacy there where you commune with him. And it goes beyond hearing, develops into seeing, which eventually ends with you handling to where it's as real and tangible as if he's sitting in the room with you and you're giving him a hug and he's hugging you back. Because he's alive on that level and wants to be real to us on that level. But you develop that through knowing eternal life. But what is eternal life? That we may know you, Father, and your only Son whom you sent. And do you know that word know in John 17 breaks down in the Greek to be the same word that they use in the Old Testament when they said Abraham knew his wife? It's a Jewish idiom for sexual intercourse. I'm not going to get, everybody's like, oh man, that's getting weird. Like, you know that the church and a marriage are parallels that we are the bride of Christ and that he's our groomsman. Oh, don't, don't leave me now. I know y'all are like, man, we're checking out on that one. Like, do you know that the mystery in Ephesians, that the, the, the man's going to leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife? And the two, everybody say, become one. They become, everybody say that. You become one. Well, he that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit. You know, it says that in the Bible, right? In John 17, if you keep reading, that Jesus says that, Father, that the glory that I have would be in them. Uh, that the way that you're in me, I would be in them, and we would be made one in a unity and a union. Because if you're born again, you are brought into the union of knowing the Father through spirit-to-spirit contact. And to know him, when it says that this is eternal life, that we may know you, that word know breaks down in the Greek to a Jewish idiom of sexual intercourse. That's talking way more than intellect. That's talking communion on a whole nother intimate level that we're not used to. Amen? Oh, I'm, yeah, we're making people uncomfortable. Hey, Amen? I'm not getting weird with that. What I'm trying to say is, if you're born again, you became one with the Lord. In the same way a man leaves his father and mother and, and he's joined into his wife and the two become one. You know that's a picture and a parallel of you leaving the house that you were brought up in. And do you know the house you were brought up in before you were born again was spiritual death and sin? Because you had to be saved. And so when you become a new creation, you leave your father and mother who, you know, those that were born not of the will of flesh or the will of man, but that were born of the spirit of God, you know, according to John, being born again. So you leave your father and mother's house and you're joined into your wife and you become one with her. That's a parallel of speaking the great mystery between Christ and the church. So when you become a new creation, guess what happens? You walk out of sin and death. Boom. The house you grew up in was destroyed. And you become a new creation. And you become one spirit with the Lord. You become a member of a new household. You become a new creation. And listen, you are joined into the Lord in that union. And the same way there would be a development of intimacy in communion, in a marriage is the picture that God designed and desired for the church to see him in. The two become one. But you know, you can have a marriage. We've all, man, me and my wife go out on dates. And we'll be sitting and eating and talking and you look across the room and there's like a couple there that you know they've been married a long time and this is all they're doing. They're just staring at their phones. And two hours goes by, and they never look up once and say one word to each other. But they're married. But they've lost connection and communion, and they don't really know each other anymore. Oh, we're getting prophetic now with where the church is and Jesus. Because just because you're one with him doesn't mean you're still in communion with him. Doesn't mean you know his heart. And he wants us to. But if you're in that position, a lot of times you become religious and (laughs) there's a barrier, you know. But God desired rich intimacy and communion and for any relationship to thrive, there has to be face-to-face communion. And I'm not talking about a FaceTime call. (laughs) Amen? 
It's a parallel of Moses. God, I want to see you face to face. God says, you can't, because if you do, you'll die. So he shows him his backside, but it was a picture parallel of the coming Christ that the veil has been removed. So we all now with open face beholding the glory of the Lord, get the picture. You can now look in him face to face, intimate contact and commune with him and be absolutely transformed knowing you are born again. You're just like him. Because he's in you and you're in him and you are one. And in that union and unity, that is where dominion over sin is found. Because you start to realize sin has lost dominion over me. If you're a new creation, you died to sin, you don't have to sin anymore. Oh, can I get 10 million hallelujahs there? Should you continue in sin that grace may abound? Do you guys know the Bible? God forbid. Well, do you know why that is? Because when you were brought up in your house with your mom and dad, you were enslaved to sin because they brought you up, you know, in sin. I'm just using a parallel and a picture here because you must be born again. And when you're born again, the upbringing that you had in the old home, it dies. And you are now brought into a new home where you're one with Christ. You left your father and mother. You're supposed to leave them behind. Like the man always takes the hit. I don't know if you ever realize that, but usually you're a lot closer to the woman's in-laws than you are to the man's, you know? <laughs> like you leave them behind and you're brought into a new home and you become one in that home with the Lord. And that's where you realize you are a new creation and the old home doesn't even exist anymore because sin has lost dominion over you. But it's not supposed to stop there. There's supposed to be a development of communion. And see, most people, most people in the church, and I've been traveling, I've been a part of a lot of church circles, I've been on lots of prayer meetings, you know, and, and most people in the church do not know who they are. And the reason they don't know who they are is because they don't commune with the Father. They don't read this Bible. And, and not only read it, but go beyond hearing, because you can't just hear. What do you got to do? You got to hear and do. So you hear and do, and then you go beyond into seeing, and your relationship develops to where you see Jesus intimately in your everyday life. And then that starts to develop where hearing and seeing goes into beholding and holding him in a tangible, real relationship where your reality exists, where he is more real to you than the very skin on your bones. And that's a man that's possessed by God, amen? That's a woman that gets possessed by God. To be filled with the fullness of God by knowing him in this communion. A lot of people talk about prayer. Not a lot of people pray. But we can. Because prayer, all it is, listen, teach us to pray, Lord. Teach us to pray. My Father. Just think about that. Let's just change the way we look at prayer. <laughs> My Father. So intimate. Like you're my father. I'm going to talk to you like you're my father. I'm going to look at you like you're my father. I'm going to know you that you're my father. Because the father loves his children. He does. And whom the father loves, he corrects, tutors, chastens, and convicts. Amen. My father. He's drawing us into this intimate prayer of knowing him. The Son of God came. Listen, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. 1 John 5.20. The Son of God has come. And he's brought to us this understanding. His blood was spilled for this revelation that you may know him and that you may understand that you're in him. And that revelation changes everything because when you realize you're in him, you realize you're not of the world anymore. So you are born again. You are a new creation. You have newness of life. You are free from sin. You are born from above with the dominion power of God to walk just like him. Just as he is. He said, be ye holy for I am holy. You were born of him. You were brought into him. You were made one with him so you could be just like him. And I'm here to tell you that that exists inside of you right now. Everybody say right now. 
that now you are a son of God, 1 John chapter 3. Now you are a son of God. Right now, now. Everybody say now. Ooh, I'm getting excited. You feel that? Now you are a son of God. Well, it doesn't yet appear what you shall be. But we do know this, that when we see him, we'll be like him. Let's just hear the revelation there. When you see him, you're going to realize you're like him. But the revelation is he's telling you, beloved, now you're this. Meaning you don't have to wait until then to see him. Listen to this. Woo. That was from, from the beginning, which we heard, which we have what? Seen. Beloved, now are you the sons of God, and it doesn't appear what you shall be. But we know this, that when you stand before him, you'll see him as he is, and you'll be just like him. Oh, there's a, riddle, there's a riddle revelation there that you're it now. And when you start to commune with him and see him now, you realize how he sees you. And you're just like him. Everybody say, I'm just like him. And the more you commune with him on that level, the more you develop and understand. He's in you, you're in him, you are one. When you understand that, you know loneliness goes out the window? And do you know loneliness drives everybody into situations they shouldn't be in? That's why you watch things you shouldn't. That's why you eat things you shouldn't. <laughs> That's why you do things you shouldn't. Because there's this hole right here where you feel like you're missing something. Like, I'm, I feel lonely. I feel insecure. I feel like I need something to fulfill me. And that loneliness drives you into situations a lot of times that you can't handle. And the power of the revelation and understanding that he that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit. You'll never know this for yourself until you take Psalm 91 and that becomes a reality. Where you... Put yourself in first person position where it says he that dwells in the secret place of the most high will abide under the shadow of the almighty. But until you learn to dwell, you won't know he's with you. But when you learn to dwell, you realize he's always been there. Like the, the, one of the best places I like to be is by myself, alone. Everybody say alone. Like alone, where it's quiet, where I can hear my own thoughts for long periods of time. Because it's there and only there that I reckon and realize I am not alone. But he's in me and he's with me. And then I start to fellowship with him right there in the, the place of loneliness. You know, in Matthew 4, where it says that the spirit, you know, drove Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Do you know that word wilderness breaks down in the Greek to be a desolate and lonely place? You know, that's where you find God, right? Because you turn your affection off of everything else that's feeding you. You unplug it. And you go to that place where it's quiet and it's still and it's desolate. And desolate means everything there is dead. <laughs> but not everything there is dead because you're there and he's in you. You're in him and you are one. And in the desolate, lonely place, that's where you're supposed to realize I am never alone. And that is where your identity is strengthened to grow in the understanding that everywhere that you go, you could be confident that you are a child of God. But not only are you born of him, you're with him. And he's with you. And he wants you to see that and believe it so that you be who you are everywhere that you go. And when you realize who you are and you realize that when you're with him, you're going to change the world. Because he's in you. You're in him, and you are one. A lot of us can't get alone with our own thoughts. We're too, oh, you talk about that. Like, we're so accustomed to just entertainment. We're afraid to be alone. We thrive in this insecure place where we need relationships outside of us. And I'm here to tell you, the only one that will fulfill you is the one that exists inside of you right now. 
It's not outward, it's inward. It's not, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, it's within you. And when you realize that you're carrying the most powerful place that exists on the inside of you right now, and when you start to commune in an authentic prayer life, and you develop what it means to know eternal life, and you go beyond hearing into seeing into handling, that you start to develop that, you become the most confident person in the whole world because you know, you know, everybody say no, you know eternal life. You've come to know it for yourself in the intimate communion because you shut the world out. Oh, this is the best part of it. You, you shut everything out and you go to a desolate place <laughs> where no one's there. There's no entertainment. Your wife's not there. Your kids aren't there. All those relationships that we have that help fill us, you know, they're not there sinful relationships we have they're not there and you get past all your thoughts all the condemnation for all your bad decisions all you know what I'm talking about you start to think I can't get too quiet because I just don't like where I'm at why don't you change it change where you're at but it's only found in the quiet place when you start to develop that communion, you start to drink of that water, I promise you one drink, you're never going to go thirsty. It'll change you forever. It, it's a wellspring of everlasting life that starts to pour out of you. And when you start to realize, my Father, I can have daily bread. <laughs> That's when church people in church stop starving and they start eating. Because you don't eat, listen to me, you do not eat when you come to church. You eat when you go to the desolate place. Nobody's there. <laughs> oh, this is so good. Somebody say glory. You don't eat when we're all together and we're, we're, we're communing. and that, That's wonderful. But it's when you're alone, when this isn't here, the worship team's not there. Pastor's not there to encourage you. It's you and your life and where you're at. I'm not there. The guest speaker's not there. There's nobody there but you and the Holy Spirit. And there's no entertainment outside of that but you learning to commune with what is real eternal life. That is what's going to change you to where you're going to transform. Because you're going to see him for as he is. But guess what? When you see him for as he is, beloved, now are you a son of God. When you see him, you should see you because he's in you. So be ye holy doesn't turn into an act or a striving. It becomes a revelation. I'm a good tree. <laughs> and a good tree can't bear bad fruit, Richard. <laughs> can't change who you are you be who you are everywhere you go amen oh and I feel it Holy Spirit's calling us deeper all of us all of us there's no greater experience in this life besides knowing what eternal life is because listen we're going to spend an eternity worshiping him but you don't have to wait until then to start it See, Jesus, not only did he bring heaven down to us, he literally ascended you up into him because <laughs> you've been seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're in him. He's in you. You are one. You have access to all that the Father has through the person of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and that is what the blood of Jesus paid for with his death, burial, and resurrection. Listen to this. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and no man comes to the father but by him he didn't say no man comes to heaven but by him nor did he say no man escapes hell but by him <laughs> he said no man comes to the father but by him teach us to pray lord our father death burial and resurrection the blood that was spilled it had a purpose it had a reason and that was that Jesus was going to take you by the hand 
and that family that you grew up in, he was going to walk you out of it, and he's going to bring you to a new family. And he was going to get you, and he was going to sit you down in the lap of your new father where you could now start to commune because you're born of him. He's in you. You're in him, and you are one. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And those of us that were born again and put our faith and trust in him were brought unto the Father through the power of his name. Amen? So listen to me. This isn't, uh, this is super practical. The best way you could develop this is when you leave here, get by yourself. Get alone and start to commune, commune with the Father. Treat him like he's there because he is. Matter of fact, treat him like he's, he's, you know, he's not only here, but he's with you everywhere that you go. And some of you that have been living in sin, like you need to repent, but you need to also realize that the Father is still there. Amen? Amen? And that he already knows that you sinned and that his position towards you is Luke 15, the prodigal son. And all he's looking for is for you to come back and say, Father, I have sinned, yeah? And as soon as those words just came out of the prodigal's mouth, it said that the father was waiting on the porch. He literally runs, throws himself on the son, kisses his neck, and embraces him back in to the original home where he repent, repent quickly, and then know that, you know, I remember this one time, my little daughter Mila, I'll never forget this. We were trying to teach her to not get out of her crib during nap time. And so like, hey, it's nap time, stay in your crib. And if you're like a two-year-old, those crib, that, the cribs are literally like jail bars. They're like, they want to break out of that thing. At least down for a nap, they're trying to figure out how to get out. And I'll never forget it. We put her down for a nap and like we're in the other room doing something and it was quiet for a little bit. And all of a sudden I heard this ruckus, like something was happening. And like I go in the other room to see what's going down. And my little Mila had learned how to crawl out of her crib. And she was on the floor reading books in the dark, right? Like just get this picture, a two-year-old. She's like reading books in the dark. I don't even know how she could see it. But she's sitting there. They're all out. There's like 20 books on the floor. And she's going through them. And like as this is happening, I walk in and she sees me. And as soon as she sees me, she literally throws the book in the air and takes off running towards the crib. And she jumps onto it and is like hanging on with dear life, trying to climb back in. And what's hilarious to me is she's thinking, I can't see her. And so she's stuck on the crib, like, and she starts crying. And in her brain, she made a clean escape. Like, she got away, she's getting back in, and I'm just there. And, and I just break down and start laughing as a dad. Like, I couldn't help it. I just started laughing because I'm like, she thinks I can't see her. You as a Christian, every single time you sin, you need to realize Jesus can see you. You're not getting away with nothing. Oh, Sheikah Baba. There's another Sheikah Baba right there. Amen? You are not getting away with nothing. But the revelation that you're born again, here's where the Father's heart is towards you. He's going to chasten you as a daughter and as a son, which means he's going to convict you and remind you that you were brought out of your old household of sin and death. You were brought into a new household of newness of life. And he's going to remind you that you shouldn't do what you did back there. But you should do now what I'm showing you in the new house that you're in. And he's going to convict you. Everybody say convict. He's going to convict you, but the conviction is going to remind you that you're born again. And that you are a new creation and you can overcome because he loves you. Amen? So those of you that have been living in sin in here, like, you just need a quick repentance. It doesn't have to be tears. It doesn't just, Father, I'm sorry. Woo, he's going to he's gonna embrace you. He's going to kiss you. He's going to put a robe on you. And he wants to restore that fellowship as if it was never broken. And then he wants you to see that, beloved, now you're a son of God. You start to see him so that you walk away and you stop sinning. Amen? It's real easy. As a matter of fact, let's just bow our heads real quick before we, there's actually a lot of us in here that have been, we have a guilty conscience. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus loves you. <laughs> and all he wants is for you to just repent and just deal with this and just look at him with 
Just, God, I want to know you. Because he wants you to know him more. So, Father, I just thank you right now that you're showing all of us in here that have been sinning. Whew. We've been overriding conviction in our conscience. And, Lord, we know it. But right now we come to you and we tell you that we're sorry. We acknowledge that we've sinned. And that you're chastening us, but that we could move on from this and grow. And that we could step into obedience and not do it again. By the blood that was shed in the power of the gospel in Jesus' name right now. And what the Lord wants us all to do is to start making some decisions where you start to develop communion with him. I'm not going to put a religious stamp on how you do that because communion is as simple as getting alone and saying, Father, <laughs> and letting that prayer life start to grow. Because intimacy is the goal and intimacy is going to get you to see him, to see who you are, to go and then change the world because he wants to seek and save that which is lost. And he's calling a lot of us in here into the desolate place. Ooh, so good. away from the glam and prestige but back into the quiet desolate place where there's no life there outside of you only the life that's inside of you <laughs> oh, that's where I want to live so Father I just pray that we all respond to that that we respond to you and that we learn to go into that place of quietness where there's no life outside of us only the life that's inside of us. Oh, Lord, and let us learn to commune with you there. And develop that intimacy, Jesus. Jesus' mighty name. Oh, let's all stand. Let's all stand. I'm going to switch gears here. We're going we're gonna to minister now. Mm. There's a, oh, man, there's more than a few of you in here. We have time for this pastor okay because <laughs> there's more than a few of you in here that can't speak in tongues mm. and you want to and there's a lot of reasons why you haven't been able to some of you in here there's been questions some of you in here there's been theology some of you in here have tried and it hasn't worked some of you in here have been prayed for and nothing happened but I'm here to tell you in Mark 16, Jesus, when he's giving the Great Commission, he says, uh, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel, you know, every living creature. And then he goes on to make the most profound statements. He says, these signs shall follow them that believe, okay? So I just want everybody in the sound of my voice right now that's a believer in him. Are you a believer? Wave your hand at me. Just wave your hand at me. You believe in him. Amen. Let's settle that. So these signs will follow you that believe. You are going to cast out devils, okay? You are going to take up serpents and deadly things and it will not harm you. You are going to lay your hands on the sick and they will, everybody say will, they will recover. But listen to this one, listen to this one. You will speak with new tongues. Okay, everybody that's a believer, wave at me. Oh my goodness, so that means you as a believer have the right to speak with new tongues. Jesus said that. So listen to me, anybody that's told you that it's not for you, they're not saying the same thing Jesus does. Let's just settle that. Well, tongues aren't for you, brother, they're for some. No, 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 Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. One more time, if you believe, wave your hand at me. Woo! They'll speak with new tongues. That means that is absolutely for you. Everybody say for me. Point at yourself. For me. Oh. And there's a lot of you in here that want that gift. I feel it. So listen, we're going to open up to pray for that right now. So I want you to come forward right now to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
and speaking of other tongues, okay? Don't be afraid. Come on up here. There's like more than a dozen of you in here. Come on up here. Right up here to the front. Don't be afraid. This is absolutely for you. And do not, who, do not let your mind talk you out of this. Come up here. Don't be afraid. Come up here. Yeah, first brave ones. That's wonderful. Come up here. There's more than just two. Listen to me. I hear the Holy Spirit. There's more than just two. There's more than a dozen here that cannot speak with tongues, okay? And we're going to go through and lay our hands, and, and fire is going to hit these people, amen? Holy Ghost is going to hit them. There's more of you here. Please come. Please come. There's more of you here. Listen, when I hear the Holy Ghost, I'll wait. I'll wait. And He's telling me there's more. Please come. Come, Every, if you could speak in tongues, speak in tongues right now under your breath. There's, there's more of you here that cannot speak in tongues. Please come. Daniel, can you help me? There's more of you here.